Good afternoon. Wow, what a difference a year makes. Um, last year, we were able to host this event in person at the JCC in Boulder. Uh, well, this year, we are hosting our first ever virtual Aging at Altitude Speaker Series and Expo. Uh, my name is Al Manz. I'm the president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media and the publisher for da The Daily Camera and moderator for today's session. First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, second seminar. Today's topic, yoga, how it supports healthy joint mobility and aging at your highest potential. I certainly want to do that. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I want everyone to notice um, the Q&A and chat features at the bottom of your screen, uh, either your Zoom screen or your computer screen or the, your other device. Um, you can ask questions or chat anytime during the, uh, the presentation. And uh, we'll, we'll have about 40 minutes of presentation, about 20 minutes of Q&A afterwards. Um, and I'd also like to remind everybody to please visit dailycamera.com slash aging and support our virtual expo. Um, we wanna support our advertisers and our partners. Now let's get started. Um, please welcome Jeff Bailey, owner of Yoga Loft and founder of Avita Yoga, and Laura Inbody, owner of Kait Yoga here in Broomfield. Uh, Jeff will be our first presenter, so I'll, I'll turn it now over to Jeff. All right. Thank you, Al. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, thank you, Daily Camera. And thank you for hosting this wonderful event that I've been wanting to be a part of now for several years. And so it's great to be here virtually. Great to have you. My name is Jeff Bailey. And... I wanna share just a little bit about my background and how it is yoga has become such a significant part of my life. I grew up in Gunnison, Colorado. My dad was a veterinarian there. So I grew up as a kid, I had my hands in everything. Uh, this is in the 1970s and the, in the early 80s when uh, <laughs> veterinary me medicine was a very organic thing. We had a ranch setting that, that we were always around animals and horses. And so I learned a lot about the physiology of the body and how our bodies work. I've always been fascinated with that. And then at some point in my early teens, I also began to notice how the people in my life were aging so quickly, including my dad. It's hard work, the kind of work that, that he did and we did growing up. Uh, I remember one time my dad was in so much pain, he had to crawl. He literally crawled to work. He would pry himself up, do a surgery on an animal, get back down on the floor and crawl back uh, out of the office. I mean, it was, it, it, those are indelible images in my mind. And I knew there had to be a better way to live in these bodies. In my early 20s, it was 1985, I walked into my first yoga class and it inspired me so much. Uh, it was felt amazing to me to have something that calmed the mind and opened the body up to all kinds of physical new possibilities. So through my 20s, while doing all kinds of other things, I studied a lot of yoga with a lot of different people. And that inspired me to become a rolfer. In my early 30s, I became a rolfer. And the rolfing training, in many ways, I will often say, was the best yoga training I ever had. It taught me how to see patterns in the body. It taught me to question yoga. It taught me all about the myofascial connections and where the changes can occur in the body. So that's the backdrop for me and my talk. And so now I'd like to switch and share my screen a little bit and share a few images with you. Okay, now, can you see that? See my slideshow, Al? Okay, I'm gonna assume you can see my slide, my screen. Uh, there are two things that are constantly working against us in our lives, time and gravity. They can't be overcome, but they're constantly pressing on us, time and gravity. Every 24 hours, I hate to say it, we're a day older. So we have to deal with aging in and of itself. But there's another thing that we overlook, and that is trauma. Mild or major trauma can happen physically, mentally, and emotionally. 
and any kind of trauma will find its way into the body and into the joints, in and around the joints, because as Ida Rolf taught me, well, and her teachers taught me back in the early 90s, the body and these tissues remember everything, okay? So the trauma, time, and gravity all have this impact that tends to get stored in the body. And then at some point during our lives, it gets pushed to certain places and then we end up having pain. And pain is oftentimes around the joints, the shoulder, the elbow, we get a bad hip or a bad knee. Sometimes it shows up in the ankles and the toes, okay? So these are a few facts that I think help set the stage, not only for how I got into this practice, but the things that we need to look at factually in order to appreciate this practice called Avita Yoga. Now, here's a couple more facts about the practice itself. Those who can do yoga tend to overdo. Why? Because we all like to get better at the things we're good at. It's just a natural human trait. And so when we search the internet, like I did here, I just did a search for yoga and then clicked on the images. This was the, these are the first ones that showed up. And what do you see but a bunch of able-bodied people doing these shapes perfectly, oftentimes in beautiful settings? Okay, inspiring for them, but, as, as a person who doesn't have this kind of a body, you know, we come into the body with, with a unique constitution. If my constitution is not set up to do these shapes, then I'm, I, may, I may not even try the yoga. Or I may go to a class and see the people around me and say, this is not for me, okay? So those who can do the practice tend to do it and do it and do it. It helps develop self-esteem. There's lots of reasons to do it, but they tend to overdo and that becomes a problem. All right, and then, oh, and here I even have a picture. This is the picture that uh, a screen grab from Facebook. This is the picture that was shown. Now, even these people, they're, they're further along in their years, but they're still performing. There's this idea that we have to perform yoga and that, in my opinion, the moment we start to perform is the moment it's no longer yoga. Now, here's the other part of it. Those who can't do yoga, don't. Like I mentioned before, they look at the shapes and they just think, no way. Now, here's another screen grab of uh, this, this when I searched yoga and seniors. Okay, so now we get these images of people that are still performing there's this performance element and i know a lot of these are are staged shots but that's the part of the problem a staged shot that has this idea of performing uh it, it, it it's not that far away from the attitudes that we have about our bodies by seeing young slim models all the time okay so we have I, I want to take this honest look at the practice because this is what inspired me to open Yoga Loft. I wanted to find a way for people who needed the yoga most to be able to benefit from the practice. So those who can do yoga overdo, those who can't don't. Why is this? Why do we have this dilemma? Well, it's because Muscles don't stretch. If you're born into a body that has innate flexibility, and for some, it actually feels good to stretch the muscles. It's kind of inspiring and invigorating. It doesn't mean it's good for them, but they're, they have this propensity to stretching and it feels good to them. That's why those who can overdo. But if you don't have a constitution like that, you start trying to stretch your muscles and you hate it. It's like fingers on a chalkboard. One class, you can't wait to get out of there, you're done and you're never gonna come back, okay? So I'm trying to shed some light on that. So if they don't stretch, so here's a slide that basically just repeats what I just said. 
And if you overdo, you tend to, uh, if you don't get a minor injury and drop out, then if you overdo over a long period of time, that gets us in trouble because once you overstretch a muscle, there's a cost to that. Okay, enough of that. So what is the goal of yoga? Uh, hopefully, after what I've just shared with you, you might be asking this of yourself. Why would I want to do yoga? Okay. First of all, the goal is not to get better at it. The goal is not to accomplish it. The goal is not to perform at it. Okay. Like our Master Yoda says, we don't try because the moment you try, then you have to overcome something. And to overcome well, actually only reinforces the problem. That's why in the scene in, in Star Wars, there was no success lifting the ship out of the muck because he felt like there was something that he had to overcome. And the moment he stopped trying and, and, and merged with the surrounding environment, then he had the ability to work with it. He embraced the problem instead of trying to overcome it and fight it. And that is a key element to the Avita Yoga practice. Okay, I'm gonna share a few. These are my goals and I hope that you might share them with me. The goal of yoga is not to get better, then why do it, okay? Here's a goal. This was, this was one that I share often. It always gets a little bit of a chuckle. I want to be able to get dressed alone the rest of my life. What does that imply? It means I, I want to stay out of assisted living. I want to stay out of a nursing home. If I can keep my body functioning fluidly, then I, I get to keep my independence. I want to be able to wash my own feet. See, at some point, in a 20-year-old, this will never cross their mind. Probably not in the 30-year-old or 4-year-old. At some point, it dawns on us that we have to sit down to wash our feet. And so then we just sit down, and that becomes a pattern. And, we, and so the aging, time and gravity just keep taking over. I want to enjoy the time with my family. I want to enjoy my favorite activities, indoors or outdoors. I want to be able to go for a nice walk, pain-free. And ultimately, I want to live comfortably and peacefully for a lifetime. Now, those are goals. We need a practice that, that, that can sustain those activities. We need a sustainable practice in order to have a sustainable life. Now, here's another key element that I just want to share with you. There's an entire lecture here, which was one I do in my teacher trainings. There's a difference between the pursuit of fitness and the pursuit of health. And we errantly mistake the pursuit of fitness as being equal to the pursuit of health. But I'll tell you right now, you can have too much fitness. You can pursue fitness and not even have it and diminish your health at the same time. So just hold this idea a little bit and play with it as you, as you pursue any activity. Are you pursuing health or fitness? Okay, in short, the goal of Avita Yoga is to have health and freedom in body and mind for a lifetime. How do we do that? All right, <clears throat> so we have, I'm gonna, Stop my sharing. Okay. You see me on the screen now? Okay. So <clears throat> we got to get to the problem. Why is it that I can't reach up on the shelf and grab that cup off the high shelf? What stops my shoulder from going this far? Right? There's, there's a problem in there. And what do we tend to do but reach for a pill? We try to take something that alleviates the pain, but the pain is just the messenger. The pain is not the problem. And the pain and the problem are rarely in the same place. This was another one of Ida Rolf's uh, famous lines. The pain and the problem are never in the same place. It might seem like it at times, but it's never really in the same place. Okay, sure. If you're if you're walking around and you stub your toe and how that hurts and you share a few discouraging words 
and oh, okay, yeah, well, in that moment, in acute situations, the pain and the problem are in the same place. But that stubbed toe, even at the age of 17, 18, if that stubbed toe doesn't heal, if it doesn't mend fully and completely and totally, which most injuries don't, we tend to overheal, which produces scarring, which produces a limited range of motion. And now that scarring, over time, we may forget about that stub toe altogether, but later in life, I don't know if you can see me walking here, but if I favor, if I favor my foot or my toe a little bit, then I'm already kind of hunching over, right? And, I, and if I walk around with a stiff toe, I can feel the pressure that goes into my left hip. And then my spine starts to get a little curve in it. And then if I flash forward decades, and now gravity and time, everything starts to pull down on me. And all of a sudden, my posture is compromised. And then we start doing work to fix the posture. So while the problem is down in my toe, and now all this, these pathways through my body, now I just try to fix the posture and it's still not very pretty. That's why a lot of us, as time goes by, we end up like this and all we can do is get the head up a little bit, okay? So, and then we need a cane, okay? So, so what Avita Yoga does is that we use the shapes to get to the problem. Not only finding the problem, but unwinding the patterning that goes with it because the pattern the way I walk through my life is also going to reinforce the restrictions and the pains and the problems that, that support the pattern. There's a, there's a relationship between the pain and the pattern. So we gotta undo all of that. Now here's another key point. We gotta start to reconsider our idea of what pain is. Instead of trying to kill it, like killing the messenger, we want to respect the messenger. It's just the messenger, right? What does the messenger have to say? Okay, well now I start to develop a relationship to it. And as we move into these shapes very thoughtfully and very deliberately, we slowly over time work through the pattern, through everything until finally we get to the problem day by day, month by month, year by year. I've worked with hundreds if not thousands of students over the years, many of them still with me now after about five years now that, that I've been teaching this style. And it's amazing how I can see these bodies change and the positive comments that come. It's a lot of fun to share. Now, Back to my screen, I'm just gonna finish up. Okay, so that's a little bit of how we do uh, that, a little bit of the, the theory anyway. See, we really have to, we have to practice and begin, really we begin anew moment by moment with the end in mind. We have to rethink the practice. So when we show up to the practice, we show up with our bodies, we bring them into the room, we come into various shapes, and I'm illustrating a few shapes here. We use bolsters, we use a yoga mat, straps, sandbags, blocks, we use a lot of different things to, first of all, slowly begin to introduce the mind really to the sensation that is now the sensation of healing. So the mind starts to change and starts to view pain as not really the problem, but as a messenger. This is a picture of me on the right. This is all, th these pictures are all back from pre isolation days. And so I use my hands as a, as a rolfer. I use, I've always used my hands a lot. And, and my eyes, I can see the shapes, I can help move a little bit, refine with my hands, but this is the role a teacher plays. 
Again, some students, this is a picture here in the room I'm standing in right now. You might be able to see the mountains in the background. We have this beautiful view from the studio. Uh, here's an example of a woman and a guy on the left there working on their shoulder, right? We're using the wall supportively to slowly get closer to the problem in the shoulder, which sounds crazy if you can't do that because it's always painful. But if, you'll, if you trust the process just a little bit, set up a private with me. I do private, um, privates through Zoom now as well. And, and, and we, we can approach this practice thoughtfully and slowly in a way that is very friendly for you. Okay, some more shapes. See, in this top one, we're working on the hands and the elbows and the fingers. Another pre-COVID shot. We have a, a, a large space and you can see how much fun it used to be <laughs> to practice in a room full of people. And, and, and here's the thing that I'd like you to see as you look at these pictures, there's no accomplishing. Everybody, the shapes are similar, but as unique as the people are. And there's a calmness on their face. If they're not breathing easily through their nose, if they're not being able to practice with their eyes closed, then they're working too hard and they're not going to get the results that we know they can get. Okay, a couple other shots here. Feedback is important. So I end up, uh, I always wanna know what people are feeling and, uh, and, and other details as we move along. Okay, so finally, I would like to give you an invitation to practice Avita Yoga. It is a moving meditation. Here's one of my favorite definitions. I have several definitions. It is a moving meditation that heals in body and mind. Many people find it to be as soothing in mind as it is for their body. And then if you wanna take a screen grab of this last, screen, last uh, slide here, there's several ways to get in touch with me. The practice at Avita Online will, uh, will come to me the avitaonline.com is our, uh, it's a platform that I've been working on for the last two and a half years. It's a, it's a hundred classes pre-recorded that progress from the very beginning. So if you've never done yoga, it'll, it'll show you how to get a bolster. It'll show you how to get all set up to do the practice. That's avitaonline.com. And of course, we are streaming live now, as well as beginning to bring people back into the studio. Jeff, we're going to have to wrap up. I don't want to take Laura's time. So um, uh, thank you. You did, you did such an awesome job. It's a unique way of looking at yoga and how it relates to health. Um, really interesting. I'm sure everybody Thanks really for stopping it. me. That was a good. That's okay. Perfect. Time. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to turn it over to Laura right now. So so Laura, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to unmute. You can hear me well and see me? Excellent, all right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laura Inbody. I am a yoga teacher and the owner of Coyote Yoga Broomfield in Broomfield, Colorado. I am so pleased to be here with you this afternoon to discuss aging at your highest potential because let's face it, we all age, whether we want to or not. And I say, if it's gonna happen anyway, let's do it with style and grace. I'd like to kick off my presentation today by practicing some yoga with you, because I can talk until I'm blue in the face about all the benefits of practice, but nothing can compare to you having your own experience and feeling the potential inside of you. Sukhasana is the shape we will practice today. It is a simple shape that we often practice in class. You don't need any special equipment, just the chair that you're sitting on. I will give direction that will work for all ages and all ability levels. And it will give you a glimpse into what I mean when I say explore your potential. 
So whether you're sitting at your dining room table or you're sitting at your desk in your office or on your couch, you can even do this sitting in your car as long as you're not driving. So if you're pulled over to the side, you can slide your seat of your car back. Everyone is capable of practicing this shape. So to begin, I'd like to say that if you're somebody who has severe limitations in terms of move movement, so pain, knee replacements, hip replacements, things that keep you uncomfortable in your day-to-day -day life, I'd like you to start by simply crossing your ankles. Have your right ankle in front of your left. And this is the beginning of your Sukhasana today. If you do not have those limitations today, what I'd like you to do is scoot forward in your chair a little bit, have your back away from the back of your chair, and both of your feet easily resting on the floor. I'd like for your hips, your knees, and your ankles to all be in the same line, and for this to be a relatively comfortable shape. So remember, if you have replacements and pain, you're crossing at the ankles. If you don't, what I would like for you to do is to take your right leg and cross it over your left. You'll have your right ankle resting on your left thigh. This is Sukhasana. Sole of your left foot remains on the floor. Left foot remains in line with your right hip. And keep your right foot relaxed. There's nothing else you need to do. Some of you will feel a little bit of restriction in the hip and your knee might be elevated. Some of you might be able to drop the knee. It's all Sukhasana. It's all the shape. So keep in mind that for the amount of people that there are out there practicing the shape right now, there are that many experiences in the shape. That, may, that many different ways to feel the shape in your body. So take a moment, close your eyes, and feel your breath. Notice the rise and fall of your chest with your inhalation and your exhalation. Notice the sensation that you feel in that right hip. What I want for you to be sure of is that the shape does not trigger any pain at all. No pain in the knee, no pain in the hip. As a matter of fact, if you were to rate the amount of sensation you feel on a scale of one to 10, you would be at about a four, maybe 4.5. Very good. From this place, you can choose to keep your body upright. If you're feeling very clear sensation in your hip, keep your torso upright. If you would like, whether your ankles are crossed or your ankle is on your thigh, you might decide to begin to drop your head slowly and begin to move your forehead in the direction of the floor. As you do this, you can let your hands drop either at your sides or maybe even have your hands out in front and only lower your torso right to that place where you begin to feel more sensation, more interest in the shape. Good. Notice 
the way your torso moves to the floor and how that intensifies the sensation in your hip. Very good. Now slowly begin to bring your torso upright again. Come back to your seated position. And gently release the shape. Either uncross your ankles or place your right foot back on the floor. Take a moment here. Feel the remnants of that pose in your hip and feel the sensations begin to drain from your system. Not because you need to do anything, but because the nature inside of you does that naturally. Good, and now let's do the second side. So if you crossed your ankles on the first side, you can cross your ankles again on the second side. Left ankle in front of your right. If you cross your legs, you can cross your legs on the second side, right? So right foot remains on the floor, left ankle rests on your right thigh. So what you might notice at this point is the difference in sensation between the two sides, right? One hip may feel open and free, the other may feel quite congested and tight. We are not designed to be symmetrical, right? We are made to move through this world, through this life, and adjust to the landscape as it approaches. And we're never going to be perfectly balanced on either side. In our culture, we sit a lot, right? We sit at meals, we sit at work, we sit reading and watching TV. And all of that sitting ends up in our bodies, primarily in our hips, causing restriction, discomfort, and lack of mobility in the hips and the low back. We use Sukhasana in our practice to help dissolve those restrictions very slowly over time. Good, so now, whether you have your ankles crossed or you have your legs crossed, on this side again, you can begin to drop your head and move forward. Allow your spine to curve. Allow your torso to be heavy. Arms drop towards the floor, and you're only moving to a place where the sensation is clear. Don't create anxiety in your system. Don't allow yourself to be triggering pain in this shape. So if those things are happening, simply lift your torso a little bit. Come to that place right before you feel discomfort. And now notice on this side, the sensation in your hip, in your low back, some of you might have your arms out in front of the shin, and that will reveal more sensation in the back of your torso and your spine. You don't need to analyze or intellectualize any of the sensations. All you need to do is feel. Very good. Now slowly again, lift your torso, come on back up to sitting, and release the shape. Place your left foot back on the floor. 
Very good. So now, if you have the room, I'd like to invite you to stand up and take a little walk. Take, I don't know, five, 10 steps away from your chair. Take five, 10 steps back to your chair. And just let the walk reset everything inside of you. While you're walking, I'm gonna figure out how to share my screen. Here we go. All right, Al, with a thumbs up. Can you see my screen? Perfect, thank you so much. All right. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines potential as existing in possibility, capable of development into actuality. I love this definition because it highlights that something is possible, but not yet in existence. It's something we get to create, like the artists we are, and the canvas is our lives. We all have within us potential, potential to grow, to learn, to become something we aren't yet. As a species, it is this never-ending yearning to see what's on the horizon, to test the boundaries, to explore the unknown that has brought about some of the most positive and expansive discoveries into the world. Today, my topic of human potential is really focused on the individual and our potential to be at our optimum in body and mind. As a yoga student and teacher, what I have learned is that when we use the body and discover its potential, we naturally, and as a happy consequence, also affect the mind and spirit. It's a beautiful synergy that I will talk more about in the coming moments. In our culture, aging has kind of a bad rap. Here's a definition by Denham Harmon of the Proceedings of the Natural Academy of Sciences. Aging is the progressive accumulation of changes with time that are associated or responsible for the ever increasing susceptibility to disease and death which accompanies advancing age. This description does seem a bit dire to me. Many of us trace through our 20s and 30s feeling kind of invincible. Then we round the corner into our 40s and things begin to shift. Knees become tender going up and down stairs. Shoulders that used to play tennis for hours are now needing an aspirin after that Saturday afternoon match. That weekend hike at Chautauqua has us lying on the couch for a day afterwards recovering. Activities that used to have little to no lasting effects now have us sore, exhausted, and wondering what's changed. These are the expected aches and pains of life. Beyond this, pregnancy, childbirth, and caring for young children takes a heavy toll on many women and their bodies. Injuries from car accidents, falls, these too can contribute to physical and emotional discomforts in our day-to-day -day lives. At some point, we may begin to believe that these discomforts are simply inevitable, a burden we must bear and learn to live with. I wholeheartedly disagree with this sentiment. I've experienced firsthand through the practice of yoga, 
specifically Kayut yoga, through my own practice and working with students, that it is quite possible for aches and pains not only to diminish, but for mobility, flexibility, and cognitive states to improve dramatically. By moving the body in deliberate, simple, yet profound ways, we can, without question, improve the quality of our minds, bodies, and spirits. While the obvious injuries I mentioned above contribute to our diminishing potential as we age, there is one more silent yet equally, if not more harmful factor that we all experience to varying degrees, a sedentary lifestyle. Take a moment. How many hours per day do you think the average person sits? The answer is 12 hours per day. Globally, the leading risk factor for mortality is physical inactivity. The consequences of physical inactivity lead to limited mobility, which results in body blockages and restrictions. These restrictions in turn limit our individual physical potential. When our physical potential is limited, it doesn't only affect our bodies, it affects our brain as well. Studies have shown that people who practice little or no physical exercise tend to have smaller brains as they age. What I propose is that through the practice of Kayut Yoga, we can shift the trajectory of our aging, physical, and mental potential to one that is ever increasing and expanding. Designed to improve your quality of life, the Kayut Method adapts the ancient practice of yoga into an innovative way that relieves the challenges of modern life. We as humans spend a great part of each day sitting and the circulatory and biomechanical impact of this modern habit is extremely harmful to the body, especially in the ankles, hips, and shoulders. Our classes are designed to work with natural movements to increase mobility and return, return the body to its ideal structure and functionality. It is suitable for dealing with all body types and able to integrate students of all ages and abilities in each class, delivering solid results for students. Intelligent use of the floor, walls, and the force of gravity allows our students to experience deep, transformative, transformative, excuse me, body work at a safe environment. Aging is inevitable, but maybe it can be something to look forward to and enjoy. Maybe we get to write our own script as we age and do it with grace and a greater degree of mobility than we ever thought possible. What if you can actually feel younger as you grow older? Improve your range of motion at injury sites and rigid joints. Improve your cognitive function. Lessen your emotional triggers and increase your energy. What if exploring your potential means you may actually feel as though you're aging in reverse? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and your attention this afternoon. I look forward to your questions. Laura, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, we've, we've got several questions. Um, and uh, um, 
I will, uh, I will ask, uh, I'll ask both of you real quick. Can you give us a little bit of uh, background on, on what are the newest trends in yoga? I, I noticed uh, you were doing chair yoga um, to some degree, Laura. Is that something that's, that's, that's becoming more popular for, for older people? Well, so I'm hearing an echo. Is, I don't know if you hear that as well. We do not. Um, so in the last few months, we've all been sheltering in place, staying at home. And when before that, we were all going to a yoga studio. The yoga studios had all of the equipment we needed props, the, the bolsters, the straps, the blocks, the chairs. When we transitioned to teaching classes at home, what we wanted to do was make sure that everybody at home had what they needed, that were able to use the, the equipment they already had read, uh, readily available. So chairs became yoga equipment and belts became straps and big Stephen King books became blocks, right? And so chairs in my practice have always been a part of the practice. We've always used them to bring the floor to the student, right? Because not everybody can get down on the floor, especially those with hip uh, replacements and knee replacements. And so we try, we do our best to make every pose available to every student, no matter their ability in that moment. And um, because we all have chairs at home, it's become part of the yoga practice more and more. Thank you. You know, one of the questions that we've got is, um, you know, this person observed that many of the poses shown in both presentations emphasize flexion of the spine, uh, cervical and thoracic. Um, uh, is this contraindicated for osteoporosis? Um, and what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Jeff, I'll turn it to you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Well, anytime we deal with an injury or a, a disorder like osteoporosis, we have a catch-22. We're, we're all getting osteoporosis to some degree, right? It's a, I think of osteoporosis as a pixelation uh, or a slow dissolution of the bone, right? And we know that, that impact and gravity, gravity alone, like if you send an astronaut into space for 10 days, or so they're gonna come back and their bones are gonna be less dense than the day they left. So we need gravity, we need impact to keep the bones dense. The Evita practice puts that kind of pressure on the bones in all kinds of directions. So it, I have found it through, uh, through observation and feedback to slow, if not dramatically slow. I can't say that I've ever stopped it, but slow that process. Now. The contraindication is, okay, I've got osteoporosis, so the concern is, if I start to curve my spine, then the pressure that comes in to the anterior part of the disc and the, and the anterior part of the, uh, of the vertebrae, that bone, the, the concern there is that it's going to crumble or that because of the lack of density there, it's gonna be detrimental to it. So you have a choice. What are our choices with osteoporosis? We avoid the very compression that could help it and opt for a drug. The drugs have lots of pretty nasty side effects. And most of them, once you start them, they recommend not coming off of them. And I know there's been some late improvements in, in some of those drugs. But so if we're not going to do the movement, if we're not gonna put the compression in there that could be helpful, in a slow, thoughtful, managed manner, like what Laura was doing, even she was slowly curving forward and done consistently enough that slow forward pressure puts the impact down into the bone. It might just it, it instigate the physiology in the body that helps to start to densify the bones. At the very least, it's going to get a little bit of movement back. So we, we've been taught, we've been programmed by many parts of the medical industry to avoid some of the very things that could be helpful. And, and I have found that if we take a very thoughtful, slow approach, that we can, we can heal all kinds of things with thoughtful compression and pressure is really what it is. 
Thanks so much. Um, you know, one of the one of the concerns obviously everybody has is is COVID nineteen. Um, we're seeing things gradually start to open up. Um, Laura, how, how, and Jeff, how are your studios dealing with this um, both from, well, I'll just ask you that question. How are you both dealing with this? Go ahead, Laura. Sure. So first we moved all of our classes online and that allows people who feel most comfortable being at home in this time to practice from their homes. On June 1st, we, in a very limited manner, opened classes back up at the studio. We have four mats out for students, which allows more than six feet of space between each student. We, um, I, we have invested, I already had two air purifiers in the studio. We now have another one that I like to call the Cadillac of air purifiers because, and it circulates the air in the room uh, more than four times an hour, right? And that's on top of the other two we already had. Um, I, at this point, I'm wearing a mask when I teach and I'm asking the students to wear a mask as well. Uh, we sanitize all of the equipment between classes and there might be more, but I'm really thorough. Um, but I also have a conversation with my students because I can't be perfect in this process, right? I, I can't autoclave my studio, as I like to say. And when we go out into the world, we're all going out into the world with this responsibility for ourselves, right? We might have an exposure that might happen. I am doing everything I can possibly think of to mitigate that from happening but there needs to be a mutual sense of responsibility as we move forward. Jeff? Well, we, um, we're spacing the mats out at least six feet apart. I'm gonna just uh, do a quick panorama of our room here. And you can see, we actually have two big rooms and you can see the mats that are laid out here. They're all six feet apart. And so we can have, we also, opened up on June 1st and uh, we can have now up to 20 people in the room six feet apart and uh, I don't think we I ha we haven't hit that number the most I've had in the room now is about 17 because what's happened I mean the trend in the industry in the yoga industry now is online it's streaming it's tough on yoga studios and so we stream the very classes we teach and they're recorded so people that have a membership can watch the videos at home in the safety of their home anytime. And, and, and we've done everything we can to provide people with necessary props and things like that so that they can practice at home. But we, we clean, we disinfect, and we have a very voluminous space with great ventilation that exchanges the outside air to the inside room uh, at a huge rate it's like it's I, I think we're about 30 percent fresh air coming into the room all the time and so it's it's just got good ventilation uh the co the colorado guideline is to is recommended to wear your mask even though you're six feet apart and so i give people the option uh, to wear it or not while they practice it's just recommended if not required Question, uh, you could just you could just give a quick uh, answer on this. Do you accept silver sneakers? We're non-discriminatory. <laughs> do you know what silver sneakers is? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. No, I'm not part of the organization, but if I, if I knew how to join it, if somebody would tip me in the right direction, I probably would for sure. Okay. Laura? So at this time, I don't, I'm not part of Silver Sneakers, but I am always open to talking to students and working within their budgets for them to make yoga a part of their lives. Excellent. Um, uh, your class styles, um, I'm interested in, and we've had questions about this, is um, older versus younger. Are there specific classes that you recommend for younger versus older participants? Or in this case, with this organization and, and what we're talking about today, older. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so I will say that the, the demographic that best fits the Avita practice here in my experience, it tends to be uh, probably 50 to 70. That's probably the, the greatest number of people that come into the practice, 50 to 70. There's a lot of 40 year olds, there's less 30 year olds, and there's a few 20 year olds. Okay, so you, you have to get to that tipping point in your life to appreciate the practice. And there are even some young people in their 20s who have learned to appreciate the practice because it's, it really is so complete. If you can keep your joints healthy, the muscles are automatically taken care of because we, the muscles have always and will always adapt to the health of the joint. So we can massage them, we can pound on the muscles, but until we get to the problem, the muscles are always going to be upset. And, but, but there comes a point, like I have students now that have been with me so long, they get so, so much freedom in their body, then they start to want more, which is why I've developed three levels to the practice. The majority of the practice is, is a green level one, which is what I, where I say that's where the magic happens. People, no matter how much they advance, they keep coming back to the green classes two to, two to three times a week. And we have an orange class every Sunday that increases the time the pressure and a little bit of complexity. And those are fun, still everybody can do those uh, and benefit from them. And then we have red classes that really up the ante for the body and for younger people, like people who have, are used to more power kinds of classes, they can do the red classes almost as an introduction to find their way down to the green. <laughs> so it's interesting how that works. And, and the red classes are now only uh, online. Okay, Laura, on, on your side? All classes are open to all ages and all ability levels. Um, we are trained to work as if we are teaching a private to each individual student. And so it's similar that um, different students have different needs, but we're trained to address those needs all in one class. And is hot versus cool still an issue? <laughs> I don't like hot yoga. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you won't find that in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That's can, I can speak to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, when you answer, ask the question about trends in yoga, I would have to say the trend in yoga is the same as the trend in the fitness industry. If we look back through the decades, what's happened, what's trended is more intensity and more creativity. And to the point where we're throwing tractor tires around and, you know, and people are praised for getting sick during a class and things like that. So it's added more intensity and more creativity, but it hasn't moved us toward better health. I'm not even sure it makes us that much more fit. So the addition of heat has been introduced in the same way because it, for some it feels good to sweat, but the problem with heat is it gives you a false sense of flexibility and you never really, it, it kind of hides the problem. So we always practice in a room temperature environment where we work with the body as it in the same environment that it goes through the day in. Excellent, that, I've never heard that explanation. Uh, Laura, um, uh, cognitive uh, functions and, and how yoga, uh, impacts it. Can you talk a little bit about that What in the last minute that we have? I think in the last minute, sure. Um, you know, when we move our bodies, we increase circulation. We increase the ability for our lymphatic system to work. We increase movements that rotate the spine, bring nourishment and health back to the spine, which for people who don't move a lot, that's an area that can get quite stagnant. And that spinal column is so important for de delivering nourishment to the brain. And so it's not something you have to think about. It's not something you have to figure out. It's simply restoring circulatory patterns, restoring the fluid movements within the body that will very, very simply and very, very naturally, your body wants to do it. 
will also bring not only nourishment to the brain, but the other piece is through the practice of yoga, there's the nervous system, right? There's the fight and flight where, that we spend a lot of time in as Americans, and especially now with this pandemic. And then there's the rest, restore, and play. Yoga elicits that rest, restore, and play. The more time we can spend there, the more beneficial that is to our minds and to our spirits. Well, I can tell you that my spirit has been uplifted by both uh, Laura and Jeff's presentation today. Uh, when this ends, I'm going to go, instead of eating that salad, I'm going to go and do some stretching and some yoga uh, poses. Nice. Um, I, I can't thank you both enough. It was outstanding. I know everybody that watched this today enjoyed it. I will remind everyone again that um, to please visit dailycamera.com slash backslash aging. Uh, to visit the virtual expo so you can see all of our um, all of our different uh, partners and advertisers that are involved in this series. Um, again, I thank everyone and have a wonderful afternoon.